This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up, you get access to Planning Ancient Rome, my new Nebula original video. Monaco, this tiny speck of a country on the Mediterranean coast, is perhaps best known for its Monte Carlo casinos and the Grand Prix. But Monaco's size makes it a very strange country beyond its conspicuous wealth. It's the second smallest country on the planet, at only 2.2 square kilometers. That's tiny, smaller than Central Park in Manhattan. But 38,000 people live there, making it the densest country. The population doubles during the day when workers from France enter the nation. Monaco has the highest GDP per capita, too, at about $166,000 per person. Monaco's uniqueness is due to its status as one of the few remaining city-states in the world, countries that are basically the size of a city. Besides Monaco, perhaps only Singapore and Vatican City qualify as true city-states, though Macau and Hong Kong have some autonomy in history as somewhat independent places. In the past, city-states used to be much more common. The Mediterranean used to be ringed by them, but now Monaco is all that's left. Why were city-states more common before? What conditions are necessary for city-states to thrive? And in today's era, where metropolitan regions wield enormous wealth and power, could we be moving to a new era of city-states? Let's take a look at a list of modern city-states. Three truly sovereign cities exist. Monaco, Singapore, and the Vatican. I would argue that the Vatican isn't even truly a city-state, but an enclave state instead, as it's really just a part of the larger city of Rome. And I'll put a few cities on the map here that have some degree of autonomy, though they are not fully sovereign nations. One thing you might notice is that most of these cities are on or near a major coastline. Now, that's not totally surprising, as most major cities are along coastlines. But coasts are particularly important to city-states. That's actually rule number one for city-states. Be on a coast, or on a river that can get you to a coast very quickly. To know why you'd be more likely to see a modern city-state in New Orleans and not Wichita, we need to go back in time to some of the earliest city-states in the ancient world. Some of the earliest known city-states were along the Mediterranean coast in the age of the Phoenicians, and included cities like Tyre and Carthage. These cities formed a loose confederation, but were independent city-states that made their fortunes trading in the Mediterranean and even beyond along the Atlantic coasts. This is rule number two. Design your city-states around trade. These city-states thrived because their individual hinterlands could not offer everything they needed to make their regions wealthy. But when cities in different regions traded with each other for goods like metals and foodstuffs, they made everyone wealthier and raised the quality of life for residents. City-states of this era were lean, wealth-producing machines with a size and government structure that maximized this goal. Ruling a large area of land that didn't have an abundance of resources was not an efficient use of capital. That's not to say inland territories and empires didn't exist at the time, and some even posed a threat to coastal city-states and their wealth, but many of the city-states were located in highly defensible locations, like on islands or peninsulas, that made it difficult to conquer. That's actually rule number three, found your city-state in a geographic fortress. And you could forget about trying to take them by sea, as they all had formidable navies. The sea was their home. Nearby city-states would often work together on issues like defense as well. The Phoenicians pioneered Mediterranean city-states, but it was really the Greeks who mastered the concept. Greece is a place not well-suited for large-scale agriculture. It has poor soil, insufficient rainfall in many areas, and hilly terrain. Cities had to turn to the sea for survival. Greece also has many islands and peninsulas where one could found a defensible city-state. Some of the more prominent city-states did have a hinterland, but they would be considered very small nations. For example, Attica, the name of the Greater Athens area, is about the same size as the modern country of Luxembourg. It's no accident that Greek democracy grew in the era of the city-state. Greeks believe cities to be the perfect size for governing. Aristotle claimed that no higher form of social union was possible than that of the city-state. He believed that participation in the apparatus of the state was not just a right, but a duty. A city allowed for sufficient social bonds and the ability for everyone to comprehend the extent of the state. Greeks had no real desire to grow their cities into larger nations or empires. Unfortunately for the Greeks, the empire came to them. Over in Italy, a city-state named Rome began to have imperial ambitions, and by the end of the Republic had figured out how to control both land and sea. All Mediterranean city-states fell to Rome, and that first era of the city-state was over. It was only after the Roman Empire fell that city-states re-emerged in the power vacuum. This leads us to rule number four for city-states. Don't be near large empires. Find areas with fewer natural enemies. Italian city-states like Florence, Milan, and Venice flourished in medieval Europe. Sandwiched between the Holy Roman Empire and the power of the Pope in Rome, these cities thrived on the ambiguity of who was in charge exactly. 
the governments of these city-states tended to oscillate between republics and monarchies, but remained largely independent for hundreds of years. This is the era of the Medicis in Florence, and Machiavelli writing The Prince about the politics of the time. Up north, city-states began to pop up along another major sea, the Baltic. Lübeck, Danzig, and Hamburg were prominent cities in the region from about the 14th to 17th centuries. Just like the ancient city-states, trade made them viable. They didn't have the agricultural resources of the Italian city-states to the south, so they made up for it by trading timber, wax, resins, wheat, and furs. They also formed a confederation based on trade and mutual protection called the Hanseanic League. They even established extraterritorial enclaves and ports in non-league cities, such as London. They would be walled and include warehouses, churches, and worker housing. These cities are a great example of all four rules for successful city-states. All of them were near coasts, in generally defensible positions, engaging in trade. Many of the larger powers in the area had not coalesced into empires, so they were free to trade without much fear. This era of European city-states ended much the same way as the ancient ones. Empires grew and city-states were too small to remain sovereign. Prussia, Sweden, and Russia eventually put an end to the Hanseatic League, though Lübeck, Hamburg, and Bremen still have the words Hanseatic City in their official names. Hamburg and Bremen are German federal states that are fairly small, about the size of city-states, though obviously not completely independent. The notion of the modern nation-state also changed things for city-states. The Peace of Westphalia in 1648, after the devastating Thirty Years' War in Europe, helped to formalize the idea of nations defined by clear boundaries. These nations were larger than individual city-states. From that point on, European nations have shifted boundaries, merged, or disappeared, but the primary unit of sovereignty has been the country, not the city-state. Well, then how did Monaco survive? Let's review our rules for city-state success. Monaco was on a coast, and old Monaco was on a rocky peninsula, great for defense. And its economy eventually moved to gambling, tourism, and acting as a tax haven for rich Europeans. Now, the fourth rule is usually the trickiest, and Monaco has had its problems with it. It has been captured by the likes of Napoleon and Mussolini, but each time its independence was restored. Today, it relies on France for defense. I'm severely abridging Monaco's checkered history, and I'll post a link to more historical information. So if Monaco and Singapore can survive as modern city-states, why not other cities? Recently, people have begun to make the argument that the age of the nation-state may be ending, and a new age of city-states could emerge. This argument often revolves around the rise of the internet. All of this digital connectivity makes national boundaries seem arbitrary and less relevant to people's lives. We live in a globalized world where we can interact without concern for where the other person lives. The internet could be the new Mediterranean, the sea for today's global trade and communication. Where cities are and what nation they are in will matter less and less. And our world is urbanizing rapidly. Right now, 55% of people live in cities, and that is projected to reach 68% by 2050. All of this sounds compelling, but I think it will be hard to completely move to a world of city-states or region-states. Most of my skepticism comes down to process. The institution of the nation-state will not willingly allow cities to secede, particularly when most people in a nation live in cities. One could maybe imagine a reorganization of national government to give cities more autonomy, though. And I certainly think it's possible we may someday live in a future where our city is more important to our identity than our country. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this kind of video, I know you're going to love my new Nebula original video, Planning Ancient Rome. This video traces the growth of the eternal city from Romulus, Remus, and that wolf right through the height of the empire. I'm really proud of this project because I think it's the first time anyone has done a video that shows Rome's growth like this. It's just really fascinating. And because it's a Nebula original, the production values are through the roof. It's 20 minutes of beautiful maps. For the insanely low annual subscription price of $19.99 or $2.99 per month, you get access to Planning Ancient Rome, as well as Nebula, a streaming video service co-owned by creators like Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, CGP Grey, Lindsay Ellis, and many others. To make this deal even better, Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream offers a vast library of high-quality documentary films by the likes of Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. So to recap, for $3, you can check out this new video, support City Beautiful and dozens of other thoughtful creators, and access a huge library of professional documentary content. To get access, click on the link in the description. Thank you so much.